Hi, this is Shadi and in this video I'm gonna be talking about Matai Montanabe, specifically his upbringing and his training in Fuzen Ryu Jujutsu and how he came up with the ground aspect. It was according to him in his own words and uh, this is an interview that was documented uh, in the Dai Nippon Judo Shi or the Great Judo History that was printed in 1939. Um, it was an interview uh, by Tanabe, he was talking about himself and talked about his father and his Fuzen Ryu uh, training and how his father coached him. So Tanabe uh, first received instructions in Jujutsu by his father uh, Torajiro Tanabe when he was nine years old. Uh, the reason why he called himself Mataemon it was because uh, it felt like a, an old retro or a classical name and also uh, his father re resembled the swordmaster Araki Matayamon. So, uh, even though he wanted to be the best uh, jujitsu fighter and his father as well, so his father was, like most parents, uh, extra cruel with him and extra tough on him when it comes to training. In the first uh, formative years, when he started training at nine years old, in his first first formative years, he hated jujitsu as he stated, but. As soon as he put on his training gear, uh, he hated losing, so he gave it his all. So regardless, even though he hated it, he kept on improving. So at the age of 14, uh, he and his father started to take on large uh, opponents, uh, mostly farmers and peasants, and they would be far bigger and far taller than him and heavier. So since Tanabe was not particularly neither tall nor uh, heavy. so. Uh, he said that, and I quote, uh, I could not see the point of taking on weaker ones. So even when he'd go on on his challenges and the dojos of where those farmers trained, he would always go for the bigger guys because uh, he felt there's no benefit in training with someone or sparring with someone uh, smaller than him. So he consistently trained with uh, those adults. He had to put up with a lot of injuries and a lot of uh, breaks from training because it, he was a developing uh, adolescent against full-grown adults that were already bigger than him so uh, he had to train with them in order to not only improve but also prove to his father that he is the best um, he experienced his first uh, jiu-jitsu competition when he was 14 it was in a small town in okayama um, this is where and his father went on uh, he, he took him to the competition and there were a lot of competitors so uh, a lot of them were adults or actually all of them were adults and he didn't know whether they would want him to let him compete or not but uh, he said that he took responsibility for it and then talked to them and volunteered to compete regardless of the age and then uh, they eventually accepted and he referred to the biggest guy who was a sumo tori and he pointed at him and he volunteered to fight him. He said that there, he felt no pressure since he was the smallest and the youngest. Uh, so whatever happens, he he was already doing a good deed by you know, challenging him and showing courage and also uh, proving to his father that he wants to be the best. So. He went on against a sumo student of uh, Nagayoshi, one of the best uh, sumo tori, and he knew some jujitsu as well. So his father was extremely worried for his son, but uh, the match started and uh, Tanabe put him at a distance and kept uh, pulling him and pushing him. So kind of like playing kumikata with him. Uh, and then he grabbed his legs and did the same, the very same thing. Uh, until that match ended in a draw however uh, the whole crowd started to clap for him and also his father was extremely proud of his son not only for his courage but also uh, holding off this extremely large built uh, sumo tori who was not only an adult but also far bigger and stronger than his own son uh, which made him very uh, proud and uh, according to Tanabe himself, he said, and I quote, his praise still remains in my memory, end quote. So 
it really showed how his father played a big role in him wanting to be the best and uh, also training as hard as he did so he said that when he trained with his father and other students uh, he would not give up neither to strangles or submissions so when he was 15 he got caught in an armbar and uh, his elbow was dislocated and he heard a large crack um, he said and i quote my tactic was to wait until my opponent got tired and then make a move to free myself it was the same with strangles um, this ability to endure locks and strangles created various strategies for me i soon uh, came to be called Niwaza tanabe so first of all not only it shows uh, how relentless he is but even fighting through injuries and unconsciousness he would go through uh, the fight in order to wear down his opponents uh, until he eventually can get like a good position so he would fight through a broken arm uh, I'm sure like the fight would end un until he like passes out because if they kept on that pressure he would die so I I'm sure he lost but he would not say it I, I don't know but uh, fighting through a uh, broken arm uh, was fairly normal uh, look at Vinny fire still pressuring on Craig's leg even though his own leg was broken the shin separated from the knee uh, the shin bone separated from the knee etc so uh, it really again shows what kind of man he was and also it uh, it sheds some light on the ground aspect so it did exist that it wasn't like there was no Neiwaza or arm locks because if you don't uh, remember from my Shiro Saigo video, um, they talked about uh, cross chokes and uh, Kami Shihogatame or the North South, uh, etc. But I believe that uh, Tanabe used more positioning and leverage, and we'll talk about that as we go further in this uh, more leverage and position in order to uh, wear out his opponents rather than uh, you know just using pure sheer strength because. He fought only bigger guys so I'm sure he had to rely on leverage and hip positioning uh, shifting weight from side one side to the body to the other in order to control the opponent I'm sure he uh, kind of found this concept out for, on his own so when he was 17 he participated in a mixed sumo and jiu-jitsu competition uh, which consistent, uh, consisted of 10 fights over one week. So it wasn't like one day for like two or three hours and then you go back home. It was throughout the entire week. Uh, his op sumo opponents all weighed about, the article says, 30 kan, which is 250 pounds. So I would say around uh, 110, 112 kilograms. Um, he beat them all except for one man called Kandagawa. He was just way too fat and far heavier than the others for him to control or do anything that might affect him. Uh, he said, and this is regarding, you know, we, we start to wonder about his Neiwaza since Fozen Ryu wasn't uh, really oriented towards Neiwaza the way he did it and the way he, uh, how do you say, operated uh, or his tactics. He said that, my jiu-jitsu was not so much the result of my uh, fine teachers. I did not learn a lot. I did learn a lot of wrist releases from my father, mainly wrist locks. So basically, uh, but because I always chose to fight strong ones and never give in, regardless of injuries or unconsciousness. In this way, my jiu-jitsu became polished, and this made me work out various ways to capitalize on my strength. For example, I came up with what I called the Unagi no Osaikata, the eel restraint. As in, uh, well known, if you press an eel with your hands, it will slide away and escape. But if you put your hand on it uh, gently, it can be trapped. So he's talking about uh, not putting too much pressure on one point and not using too much strength because they will find a way out and escape. For example, the Kezagatame. Uh, one uh, one particular uh, jiu-jitsu black belt uh, told me that it's not very uh, often used because uh, in jiu-jitsu because the uh, the point or the contact 
uh, space is too short and uh, sometimes they will slip out if you use too much strength or not cover enough space they will slip out and you will give out your back so this is the same thing if you apply too much pressure in one place or uh, too much pressure in general they will slip out but if you spread out your weight and not apply too much pressure you can uh, contain them he also said later I came up with the snake and frog technique like the snake that slowly swallows uh, a frog one bit at a time my groundwork overwhelmed my opponents in much uh, the same manner so as I mentioned uh, he would use position shifting weight from point to point in order to really keep them overwhelmed and controlled until they get desperate and then he would attack and go for the kill so basically the uh, the, the top game of Jiu Jitsu that we know today, uh, it is founded on this principle in tire out someone and really get them desperate until they do something out of desperation and this is where you catch them or just really control them and make them run out of options and then you attack with either a choke or a lock or whatever. But uh, the, the way he talks, he wasn't fighting off his back as uh, it seems. So he said, when I was 22, uh, I went up to Tokyo in Meiji, uh, this is what, in 1890, the same year I was appointed martial arts master Shihan and by the Tokyo Metropolitan Police. So if you don't remember from my first video that I talked about, this is where the whole Kodokan Tanabe uh, feud started. Um, and he said, and spent a number of years teaching Judo slash Jiu Jitsu in various schools. So I believe that he did, uh, uh, come into contact with the judo teachings uh, also uh, I linked the, the uh, Yukio Tani book which uh, he is the student of Tanabe and you can see the Deyashi Harai the guard pulling the armbar uh, so and so so it is very similar to the things that we practice today it was pioneered by uh, Tanabe himself um, so this is basically it I wanted to show uh, where he came from uh, what type of people he fought how he started training, the way he wanted to make his father proud. I believe this is very prevalent uh, in the Japanese culture. I talked about this also in Joshiro Maruyama's accounts, the way he wanted to, to make his father proud. Uh, even though he became a world champion, he's still not an Olympic, uh, or at least did not participate yet in the Olympics like his father did. So he still feels like he didn't uh, um, make him proud yet. Uh, the same with Tanabe. Uh, with the sumo fighter um, he chose the biggest and volunteered to fight him just to so he can make his father proud and the memory that of his father praising him still remains um, we can learn a lot about this great man called Matei Montanabe um, he pioneered and launched the Neiwaza that we know today of as Joe Rogan says uh, Helio Gracie had to cook out, uh, came up with the concept of cooking out your opponent and then going for the kill. Now we know where this concept really launched. It's because a small man had to fight bigger, tough farmers. You know, we talk about farmers' strength and farmers' carry, etc. So he had to fight them on a daily basis, going to their dojos and eventually going through injuries and broken arms and getting choked out till he's unconscious. Um, this is another thing uh, you can see that the uh, the ground techniques uh, worked but um, they weren't refined and uh, you know they didn't rely so much on their positioning uh, and leverage in order to get those uh, techniques for example you see how you do an osotogari or uh, like a seoinage and the arm you are holding it remains stretched out as they fall on the ground and you just lay back and go for an arm bar or go just straight into a, like a pin kind of like the judo of today in the IJF competitions uh, I would believe that it was this type of uh, neiwaza until Tanabe really refined the positioning and how to stay there for long periods of time against someone who is far larger than you and I believe this is what pioneered uh, what we call you know a ground grappling or Neiwaza uh, randori in general so uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, little uh, background story of Matei Montanabe this was again found in the Kodokan archives in the Dainippon uh, Judo Shi 
uh, or the great history of judo in uh, printed in 1939 has his own accounts and his interview uh, i hope again you enjoyed this this was shady and thank you for listening